Hi, this is Roy Griffiths. Everybody calls me Griff. And this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Roy Griffiths. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. You can find all of the archives of the show over at hankgarner.com. There are handy links over in the sidebar on the right-hand side where you can subscribe to the show. You can find uh, all of the archives in a handy little drop-down list, or there's a search bar where you can search for your favorite author and see if they have been on the show in these past uh, more than 400 episodes. Thank you to our sponsors for uh, allowing us to do this. And we've got some new sponsors coming on. Daniel Kenny, my favorite middle grade author, is just doing amazing things right now. He is publishing like a madman, uh, but he's putting out excellent, excellent books. Uh, I buy his books for my nieces and nephews uh, all the time. My, my kids are a little older now, uh, but my nieces and nephews, I buy Daniel's books and put them in their hands. They are top shelf quality and really, really fun books. Uh, there's a link to Daniel's uh, Amazon page in the show notes, and uh, we're going to be highlighting uh, more of his books as we go on this month. But go visit Daniel Kinney and uh, buy his books for your uh, favorite kids, and they will love it. Roy M. Griffiths uh, has a new book, Bringing the Fire, the Lonesome George Chronicles, book two. Uh, Roy is really doing some amazing stuff in speculative fiction, and we're going to be highlighting more of those as the uh, month goes on. But go pick up uh, Roy's newest books. There's a link to it in the show notes. If you're a fan of alternative history uh, or war and military uh, thrillers, you're going to love these books. There's a link to it in the show notes. Also, thanks to my buddies Nick and Jason from Galaxy's Edge uh, for sponsoring the show. Thanks for tuning in. As always, at the end of the show, we have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. He enlisted for the money. He stayed for the girl. Gateway to the Galaxy, the new series everyone is talking about, beginning with book one, Into the Breach. Frank and Marine Space Corps One find themselves across the galaxy in a WWE SmackDown with the legions of a boss-level villain. But the party's just getting started. He donned the mantle of a celestial knight to impress a girl. Well, an empress. Now destiny's calling in a debt. A lightning-paced military fantasy full of outlandish comedy and impossible situations that will have you hailing for these marines from the get-go. For fans of Green Lantern and the Stargate universe, listen to what some readers are saying. This is good stuff. Thanks for the new obsession. I recommend and can't wait for the next book. And the visual pictures and action are amazing. They're getting the band back together, and this time, it's serious nonsense. Pick up the Gateway to the Galaxy series by Jonathan Yanez and J.R. Castle, available now on Amazon.com. There's a link to it in the show notes. Gateway to the Galaxy. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have Roy Griffiths on the show with me today, but he goes by Griff, and uh, he is an amazing author of alternative history and uh, lots of other good stuff like that. Uh, I'm a fan of his Lonesome George Chronicles, and uh, we were just talking, and I realized that I let the release of his brand new book, The Broken Return, which is book three in that series, uh, I, I let it sneak up on me. It's already out, so when you're listening to this, you can run out and grab a copy of the entire trilogy. Uh, welcome to the show, uh, Griff. Uh, thanks, man. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have you. Uh, you know, we start each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm disappointed. I thought the, the question was something like, uh, how did you get to be so awesome? 
But uh, that's the second question. But you oh, have to get, get through the first <laughs> to get to that one. I'm getting ahead of myself, yeah, clearly. Yeah. Um, uh, the first memory of of saying, "Wow, I want to be a writer," was probably when I was about ten. Yeah. But um, I I was uh, run, ran across some stuff at my grandmother's house um, a few years ago, and and there was a story I actually wrote when I was probably about seven. So um, I guess the urge to create was always there, but uh, it was when I was uh, 10, and I ran across some Edgar Rice Burroughs books, um, The Princess of, of Mars. And um, it was I was at my grandmother's, coincidentally. Um, and, you know, it was a tough time for the family, and so there I was, this lost, lonely kid who'd already, you know, discovered – the escape hatch that you could create for yourself by reading. But when I found the Edgar Rice Burroughs books, um, you know, I mean, I, I had some money from uh, picking up Coke bottles and stuff. And so I, I, I put down a couple of quarters and I, I ride my crummy 10 speed back to the, uh, the place where we were in. And I start reading this book and like eight hours later, I remember, I mean, I, I will never forget that. Eight hours later, I come back from Mars, you know, uh, because I've been totally transported. I've been entirely in that world. Um, and I, and I, 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 that's when I decided. Edgar Rice Burroughs, Princess of Mars, I'm going to be a writer. Um, Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, has been the gateway drug for many a young man and and young woman too, I, I would imagine. But uh, yeah, he he is like you know he definitely is is the gateway uh, drug for you know the the pulp fiction life. You know you, oh, yeah. and his stuff was so compelling. I mean, I know it it has problems now, but it was just great. And uh, and you know uh, I think at the time what really appealed to me was it was like magic. It was so powerful and so, so transporting, and it seemed like real magic. And I said, I want to do this magic. Right. Well, his his Mars books, uh, you know, when he wrote those, we're, we barely knew anything about Mars uh, whatsoever. Uh, and, and same for the uh, the Mars books that Ray Bradbury wrote, but they they just absolutely you know captured an entire generation's imagination and 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 those books are still readable i i mean yeah we we probably know too much for our own good now um but you know they're great entertaining uh kind of uh, almost portal fantasy you know um if you kind of separate the uh you know the science fiction aspects of it it's really a great fantasy it is and you know if you, you say bradbury who is uh you know the god we all revere um yeah, you know they they were, they both took kind of the same um, place of the imagination, but you know they just went in different different directions. But yeah, uh, I totally totally agree. Uh, I am a massive Bradbury fan, so uh, to, to to hear that 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 makes my heart all happy. Can I can I tell you a story about Ray Bradbury? I would love to hear a Bradbury story. Okay, uh, I mean it won't surprise you because I think he's universally accounted to be just a mensch. Oh, yeah. Um, my, uh, well, my wife, my, before my wife and I met, uh, she met him in Riverside, California at some writer's conference and he was just this, you know, lovely gentleman to her and signed her copy of, uh, I think it was the illustrated man. Um, but, uh, when I was, uh, actually when I was still in the coast guard, I was still writing then because once I decided I was going to be a writer at 10, that was it, man. I, you know, I could, I'd mow lawns, I'd work as an office boy. I jump out of helicopters for the Coast Guard and get people, you know, off of sinking boats and stuff. But I wrote. No matter what else I was doing, I wrote. So, um, I he, Bradbury had this terrific story, and I, I cannot remember the the name of it, but it was the short story where the doctor was saying, you know, basically babies are pathologically insane because you know they they want all their needs gratified and stuff. And it was a story about the baby who was trying to kill. Uh, either the father or the mother. Uh, you, you know the one I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I, can't I wish I had the name, but yeah. Right. And uh, there was this great scene at the end where the doctor comes up. You know, it's like dad dead at the bottom of the stairs, and mom is you know I don't know electrocuted in the bathtub or whatever it is, and he hears little noises in the house, and he's sneaking through the house, 
and he says, "Hey, come here. You want to play? I've got something shiny in my hand." And he had a he had a scalpel. <laughs> anyway, just a, you know, that Bradbury could do that stuff better than anybody. Yeah, uh, he and, really and, could, and make it feel like a Norman Rockwell painting. He really could. Uh, but but so I I said I could make a great one act play out of this story. You know, and, and I'll just tell you, just that the scene of the shiny thing, that'd be like the last scene of the play is a guy just moving around this darkened set with just enough of a spotlight on him. You can see the scalpel flash. But anyway, uh, so I, I somehow I managed to find some contact information. This was well before, you know, uh, Google provided everything we need. Uh, I found it for Bradbury and I sent him a, um, a letter and told him his whole story. And he wrote back a really nice Larry said, hey, man, I'm, I'm sorry, but, you know, we're doing Bray Bradbury Theater on TV, so you, we can't do that. But, but you know, I, you need to write a play of your own. Well, I'd actually written a play, several plays of my own, so I sent him one. And son of a gun, if he didn't send me back a really nice appreciation, telling me how much he enjoyed it. And I've got this signed thing from Ray Bradbury saying that uh, he thought I was a good writer. Stop and Stop it. No lie. You know, and that's the kind of thing, he didn't have to do that, you know? Right. But he was—he took the time. He was just generous and a, and a, and a great guy. So um, did he write it on his typewriter? Actually, it was handwritten. Oh. He had like this sticky thing that he put on. I, I framed it. I, I you know clearly, um, clearly, and it was like this handwritten note from Ray Bradbury. Um, you know, so that is epic. That's, yeah, that's the best story I've heard today. Oh. Well, I'm, I, my work here is done, man. We should just <laughs> right. now. Yeah. It's not so, uh, so tune in next time. Uh, yes. We'll be back with uh, more uh, people that don't have Ray Bradbury stories. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome, man. That is amazing. Uh, yeah, I I would give anything for a, a signed Ray Bradbury note, and I don't think I'm going to get one at this point. Alas, no. Yeah. But, uh, okay. Can I tell you one more Ray? Terrible, yeah. short, short, heartbreaking Ray Bradbury story. So, you know, he died a widower and right. uh, in the house he'd lived in for, what was it, like 60 years in yeah. Los Angeles? Yeah. Uh, some architect, and I'm going to refrain from fully describing the architect, bought it and he tore it down. Wow. I mean, this, that, that's, that, okay. that place would be like a shrine of American I, literature I, and he I, tore it down. I can't even. I, I can't even. That's. I, I know. Uh, there Man. should be a bounty on this guy's head. Just, uh, did they put a mall up there or something? What the what the hell? Well, no, the, the the architect liked the location. But he wanted to build his own thing, you know, his own house. And you know, uh, really, uh, uh, I had uh, intemperate thoughts when I heard that story. You know, yeah. once I got over crying. But uh, anyway, that's well, lost just for you. Well, that's all for today, folks. Um, yeah, we, I, I just bummed out oh, Hank. Oh, man, that's, man that, that just ruined my day on, yeah. after that, that great high. But, uh, well, <laughs> man. In the future, I'll learn to tell the stories in reverse. <laughs> right. You need something to, to, to pick us up <laughs> after that. Well, so, uh, so age 10, you decide you're going to be a writer, and the, the kindling is, is lit, uh, as we say, from there on. Yep. Uh, what uh, like what kind of stuff were you writing, and uh, did you stay in that Burroughs vein uh, of stuff you were reading? Uh, uh, you know, what what types of genre type stuff did you did you grow into? Uh, well, I'm sure whatever I was writing was incredibly derivative. Although once in a while, I'd manage something that that had a you know enough of a spark of originality that uh, my teachers didn't want to you know murder me in my sleep. Uh, Reading wise, uh, I, I read, I stayed with the Burroughs stuff for a while and kind of drifted toward, you know, because it was allegedly science fiction. I, uh, uh, I started looking at other science fiction authors like, you know, obviously uh, Heinlein and, and Bradbury and, uh, you know, Something Wicked This Way Comes, um, which I, I read a lot just because I found that so, uh, so powerful. And, and, you know, I, I as we're discussing this, I mean, looking back, I I really was attracted to th uh, the sorts of work that made me feel as if I was in that world, J just like Princess of Mars did for me. And um, you know, but I would look for other other stuff. Um, 
So I, w- I guess I was kind of a story guy, kind of a story and emotion guy. I wasn't beauty of the language or the, you know, the, the flowing, it flowed trippingly off the tongue stuff. I wanted to know what happened, but I also wanted to feel uh, invested in the characters, which um, um, I think ultimately turned me off of, of high literature. Um, uh, I could get into a rant about that, but very basically, uh, I, I like a story. Okay, I loathe stories. I loathe the literature stuff, which is life is terrible, people are awful, uh, and you know it's just it, let's just give up. Right. Um, it's kind of nihilistic in in its worldview. Right, and and it, it's all and you know that that drifts into all the the grand Marxist stuff of you know we're all uh, pawns of the system, we're cultural dupes, and and uh, you know you you. You have the illusion of free will and all that sort of stuff, and, and which I, I think is uh, hogwash, personally. So, uh, so I mean, I when I was in college and when I was in high school, I was forced to read some literature. Um, and um, I just read for story, man. I just read for the story. I don't care about the assemblies. What I care about is, you know, does the, uh, does the story transport me take me someplace I've probably never been, or at least take me there in an original way. Um, well, you know, the, um, uh, the, the literary fiction, uh, a lot of literary fiction folks would uh, kind of look down their nose at plot-driven stories uh, as being, uh, you know, uh, kind of just dirty genre stuff uh, or, or pulp. You know, they, they say pulp with a kind of a sneer, and uh, I, I say pulp with a smile because I know – what kind of story I'm getting when you talk about Pulp Fiction. Um, and, uh, and going back to my roots, which are similar to your roots, uh, there, and, uh, and then, you know, some, uh, uh, some genre fiction folks would, would, you know, say that, uh, well, literary fiction is just all character and there's no, nothing ever happens in those stories. <laughs> and, and they're true, but, you know, um, I, I like to think that we can tell engaging stories where stuff happens and people go through, uh, you know, growth and, and, and through, uh, you know, the stuff of life. Uh, and we, we have action and we have a plot. I think you can do both. I, uh, absolutely agree. Um, one of my, my favorite books in the world is Watership Down, uh, by Richard Adams. And, and, and because I think that is the book that fits it, what you described entirely because, well, first there's just the tremendous, uh, to me, creative achievement of telling a story about a bunch of rabbits right. that's thrilling and funny and 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 heartbreaking at the same time. And, uh, you know, it's like that, that you know, the ancients thought, or else at least the, the ancient writers told us that the ancients thought that, you know, uh, creative people were touched by the gods. That was, you know, that was definitely, you know, Zeus's thunderbolt. Hit Richard Adams, um, and I, I, I read that book once every two or three years, just because. Uh, I mean, I want to try. I try to study it, but I can't because I'm pulled in. Yeah. And uh, again, completely immersive, and and I believed every every damn thing he told me. Yeah. And and sadly, we lost Richard Adams a few months ago. Yes. Yes. But but I mean, I, I you know the guy. I think he was a spook in World War II, just from. I don't know much about his life, but uh, you know, you, he was a guy that had had some experience uh, of life, which I think is an important thing for a writer. I must I must be honest. I, I agree with you. I, I think that uh, uh, some of the uh, the time that some writers spend on MFAs and things like that really could be better spent uh, getting out and, and seeing the world and seeing people and and uh, figuring out what life's about. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. So, uh, so speaking of which, uh, when did you decide that, uh, that you were going to make a go at being a writer, uh, you know, that you were going to write something, try to, try to publish it, um, kind of, when did the, uh, you know, did, did you graduate from a kid who is writing stories to, you know, I think I've got something here that somebody else would want to read. Boy, that's, um. Uh, I don't think we have enough hours or uh, tequila <laughs> here in the uh, studio to discuss it. But briefly, no, I mean, um, I, I did the writer thing when I was 
you know, uh, 10 and I got a manual typewriter and I learned to type and, and I started doing the stuff I read about, which was, you know, you write stories, you submit them. Well, this was past the golden age of pulp. So nobody was buying my 15 year old short stories, but I, I, yeah, you know, I kept, uh, I kept submitting stuff and then, um, I'd always love films because film is, um, film to me, by the way, uh, again, is, uh, you know, there's, let me back up. There's no great thing that we can create that somebody is not going to debase, right? Printing press, Gutenberg, God bless them. The first thing was the Bible. The second thing they published was probably a girly mag. Right. right? <laughs> right. And, and, uh, I think that's, that's important to remember is, uh, you know, you can have this, this stuff and, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, and, uh, but a good film, a good film to me was at the time, the closest thing to a shared dream we could have, you know, you sit in a, a theater with, um, a bunch, like 500 strangers. And for a good film, you guys can have like this similar emotional experience. You know, you can laugh, you can cry, you can be thrilled, you can be uplifted, you can be cast down. Um, so I, Again, there's that whole power of communication and, and immersing people in a world. So I, uh, I like that. Um, so since the short stories weren't really going anywhere, I started writing plays. And uh, now I have to go beat the dog. Um, I, I'm trapped here with three of my wife's dogs while she's out of town. Um, uh, but, you know, the short stories, every now and then I'd get, a, I'd get an encouraging rejection slip, you know, one out of every 60 or 80 submissions. And then, um, but I started having um, a little more success with uh, one-act plays. And I don't know if I just got lucky or if I actually had the gift. And, um, but I, you know, uh, then I, I just kept, wow, I just kept writing. But since I had a little more success with plays, I started writing plays um, more I, I would write short stories and then try to turn it into a play if it was if it felt like it fit, um, and uh, you know your question was when did I think I really had something? I had to go through this period um, where I had to let go of sort of my my ego and my misconceptions. Um, possibly one of the appeals of of being a writer was you know, being a writer guy, you know, uh, you know, you hear this, the stories of the things writers did Harlan Ellison, who just recently died, but this week, um, you know, he had all these larger than life stories and, you know, the swagger and the, you know, a guy who'd done some stuff, but he also talked a lot about what he did. Um, but I had to kind of get away from the whole, um, my entire identity as a writer, and if I'm not successful, however you define success uh, as a writer, therefore I'm nothing, which was a really poisonous thing to carry around. And, you know, because it sort of discounted the whole rest of my existence and what else I might have to offer. And sadly, that took me probably till I was about 40 to get to. Uh, being a rescue swimmer in the Coast Guard helped a lot because it gave me something else where I could see I had some uh, some competence and also it was a good writer's story. Um, but once I just kind of said, wow, I'm, um, uh, there's more to me than, than just being a writer and my, my life doesn't hinge or, uh, doesn't rise or fall on whether, um, wow, I'm going to throw something at a dog. Um, it doesn't hinge or, you know, rise or fall on, on whether somebody buys a short story of mine, uh, or a, novel or a screenplay. Although I did sell one screenplay to TV. That was nice. Um, but I let that go and I, and I just got this freedom where I said, you know, I'm just gonna write. I want to, I want to die knowing I tried rather than wishing I tried. I, I, um, it was the same thing with the rescue swimmer, um, gig that I did in the Coast Guard. I'd never done that, but I uh, never done anything like that. I was a drama geek in high school, but I, I said, I, I'm going to try, you know, and at least if I fail, I'll fail knowing that I tried rather than not having bothered at all. So 
Anyway, um, that whole long progression, I had, a, had an agent in Hollywood and uh, a manager, and I sold the one TV movie to Fox, uh, which was unproduced. But I got out of Hollywood because kind of I was tired of the death of a thousand cuts. And then I just let it all go and decide to, you know, I need to focus on being a father to my son, who was two at the time. Um, you, you know, um, and uh, so I got a regular job because two year olds need like good food and shoes, you know, <laughs> shoes, health care, all that <laughs> yeah. stuff. Because, you know, if it's just us, man, we'd just be hosers living in a station wagon at the beach. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, we'd be bar- baristas and surf in the morning. But, um, but once I let go of that, that's when I drifted into writing novels. Cause, because, I, like I said, I just <sighs> said, I'm just going to do this for myself. With screenplays, you have, oh, man, everybody has an opinion on your screenplay. Uh, and everybody's got notes. And... Um, you know, a certain point, you're like, wow, I guess I'm not really writing here. I'm just like, uh, you know, being a transcriptionist for these other people. Um, but, uh, yeah, once I, I started writing the novel, I, uh, I, I, my first novel, I, I wrote the first Lonesome George book completely for me. I just started writing it one day and I had no intention of writing a novel, but it kept going. And then um, I had no intention necessarily of really trying to publish it. I thought uh, this is unpublishable. Uh, no, no publisher will actually look at this because of uh, some of the the content. Um, and not that it's uh, body or blue or particularly uh, awful, but it did kind of come from a uh, a different point of view politically than uh, perhaps they're they're swinging with in New York at the time. Um, so. I just wrote it, and then I just happened to see that uh, there was this new publishing company out of New York called Liberty Island that was looking for short stories. So I sent them the first chapter and said, yeah, you know, this is actually the a novel I wrote. And they went, hey, why don't you send that rascal on over? We'll take a look at it. And, uh, yeah. So um, uh, from, a, from a craft perspective, and we're going to get into the book in just a minute, but from a craft perspective. You've been writing uh, a lot of short stories, been working uh, plays and, and screenplays. Um, other than the, the obvious, uh, the structural differences of, of writing a novel and writing a screenplay or a, or a stage play, you know, the, the, the physical act of writing that is, is different because they're, they're formatted different. They're, uh, you know, the directions uh, are in scripts and, and not and as opposed to description in uh uh, you know, in a novel. But other than those things, uh, what was it? What was the difference like for you switching gears to writing novels? Uh, maybe creatively, how do you get in that different mindset? Uh, kind of, what was that 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 shift over like for you? Um, well, I think you touched on a lot about the the format, particularly um, um, when I was writing screenplays. What I found I would do is I would write a twenty page treatment single space short story basically of this is the film and that was where you, you you know i could work out the story the plot the characters important events uh and things like that and then i would take that and start plugging it into a screenplay format because uh, you know a screenplay is just sort of like the blueprint blueprint for a movie and um um and even then you know, it's just sort of the bare bones blueprint um whereas uh, so I discovered when writing plays or screenplays, I had to kind of know uh, my path, you know, the whole path as I go. Uh, I start here, I get, I do this, I do this, and then we end up here. With a novel, I discovered, with both my novel series, actually, uh, I could start and I could have a destination but I didn't have a map. So, uh, for instance, Lonesome George is going to turn out to be like a four novel series just for this, uh, this part of the story. And my other, my, my historical fiction series by the hands of men, same deal. It was supposed to be one book, but it's also going to be four books because I had a beginning, the insight incident to steal a term. 
And I had an ending. And so I just sort of stepped out on faith or ignorance, uh, depending on who you ask, and started walking in that direction. And that was the biggest thing. Uh, the biggest difference was I didn't need to figure it all out. It sort of organically began to reveal itself to me. Gotcha. So you've got the two series that you're working on now, um, uh, By the Hands of Men, uh, and, and then the, uh, the the newer series, Lonesome George. Uh, you you, uh, you tend to write historical fiction uh, that by the hands of men, I, I believe, is set in World War One. Uh, yes. And, and then the Lonesome George series is kind of this uh, social commentary, uh, uh, almost um, uh, satire. Um, but also kind of post-apocalyptic, you know, it's this really great mashup, uh, of stuff. Um, when you approach these two different projects, the, uh, the hands of men and lonesome George, is there a, um, uh, a plan in place when you approach these? Do you look at these differently? Um, do, do you have to do anything particular to get, uh, switched into, uh, the headspace of one or the other? I found altering my medication helps a lot <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, uh, yeah right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because um, a lot of when I'm writing, uh, well, I do a certain amount of research, but but that's just sort of um, uh, uh, seeding the ground. Um, but uh, when I'm really when things are really cooking. Um, it's like I'm taking dictation, you know, it, I see it, I hear it. It's just happening right there inside my head. Um, but I think, I think it's the different, um, sort of feeding different parts. Um, what I found in general, whether it was a play or a screenplay or, or a short story or two new book series that I, I'm starting to plot out, uh, ideas, uh, you know, as a writer, you see stuff all the time. You hear a story uh, you hear a, a turn of the phrase and it kind of floats out there and in never, never land. But when I find the right um, vessel that some of these ideas can go into, it's like it becomes magnetized. And so there's sort of a, the lonesome George vessel, which does have, you know, it's not Swifty and satire exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, there is some some commentary and political commentary and, and social satire, which along with what I hope is a, a ripping good story. Um, but that's a different kind of vessel than the sorts of things I want to talk about in uh, in the historical fiction, because um, it really is almost two different mindsets. Uh, Lonesome George is contemporary, so I use a, a contemporary idiom and uh, vocabulary and structure. But uh, By the Hands of Men is something that um, I was trying to write as if it had been written uh, um, during contemporaneously with the uh, events. So, so totally looking for changed. a Hemingway vibe. Almost, man. It changes the diction. It changes word choice. It changes how you describe things. You can uh, you know, allude to things, but there's, there's like no blue language. There's no boinking. Um, and I'm trying to write it basically as if it was, you know, uh, it's somebody's, but the, almost the autobiography of these characters in their, in their, uh, their speeches. So, but again, sort of a different container with, uh, and that has a different kind of man, magnetizing effect and different ideas go in there. So that makes it a little easier. I don't typically work on both at the same time. It just kind of worked out that I was alternating novels in both these series so, um, uh, by the hands of man, I got to do, I, I want to do a lot more research on because I want it to be, uh, accurate. Um, uh, it's a lie, but I want it to be a truthful lie, if you will. And, uh, whereas, uh, the Lonesome George stuff is the alternative history. So I can have a lot freer hand. I still want to make it compelling and, um, you know, sort of logically consistent because I don't know about you. I hate to be reading, reading along and stuff. And all of a sudden it's like, no, you know, you said, you said that Hillary was a, you know, a, not a corrupt candidate, but she really is uh, kind of thing. Uh, 
I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, that's what I do. Well, I love the way you talked about uh, seeding the ground uh, because I think we've all read books where – uh, it, it just read like the author was stopping every page to Google stuff and, and make sure they got details right. Uh, the, the best writing seems to, to come out of when a writer just immerses himself in that time period in, uh, you know, and it just really kind of fills up on it and then just lets the writing flow out of that. Oh, wow. Thanks, man. Uh, I, I'm glad you noticed, uh, that because, uh, the, um, I'm with you. I, I hate, um, it becomes tedious. I mean, Michael Crichton wrote some really good stuff, but there's a sort of a middle phase there where he he got a little luxury. Yeah. And uh, I think it was uh, Rising Sun, the one about, you know, Japanese people selling our technology, um, where it felt you could actually feel the character settling back and getting a good stance as he began to puke out information, you know? <laughs> yes. Uh, and, yeah, you're right. I try to avoid that. In fact, um, that's one reason it's taken me so long to finish By the Hands of Men is because you read a lot of stuff, but uh, some of it might be interesting, some of it might not. But I'm, I, I tend to look more, especially in the historical stuff, for the telling detail. You know, the telling detail um, that makes it feel real. Without without bludgeoning somebody about well and, and you know this is what the uh, the gin mills were doing at the time and uh, you know we had farmers coming from here and and then the Irish were competing that's not necessarily as important unless that's the story you're telling but if it's a story about something else you still want those elements that make it feel like people really lived here you know they they this is what they did exactly um, for those that, that may not be uh, familiar with the local the Lonesome George series and the, the, the new book, book three uh, is out in that series. Now I'm going to remind folks uh, what is, what's the story about and where did this idea come to you? Uh, how how okay. did it come to you? Um, uh, let's see. Well, first, by the way, book one is 99 cents uh, on Kindle these days. Um, they're trying to reel you in, which I, I'd like to think isn't going to be such a terrible thing. Um, uh, to be honest, actually, um, the the book was was written because I couldn't write this nonfiction book. Uh, you know, during the uh, during the uh, time of dear leader Barack Obama, I had uh, become aware that there was um, a certain slant to the way things were being presented, and at a certain point, it just started to piss me off. Uh, frankly, uh, I mean, just a couple of real quick examples. Uh, I won't bludgeon you with them, but. You know, nine uh, eleven, the news, the the all the major media said, you know, we're going to spare the American public the sights of the poor bastards who had the choice of burning to death in the towers or jumping to their doom. They cut away from that because they didn't want to inflame, you know, Americans against Muslims because we're all troglodytes just waiting to oppress people of color um, and foreigners. But then during the you know, the war in the, on terror, they went to court to make sure they could be at Andrews Air Force Base with their cameras, photographing the guys in the body bags coming back. Um, R after his name. And, you know, there were just example after example of that. Um, it was Cindy Sheehan, you know, poor, bereaved woman. Son died in Iraq or Afghanistan, and so she was stalking President Bush, and she had a camera crew. They were followed her all the time because she was useful for embarrassing, um, you know, a Republican administration. Barack Obama becomes president. Casualties are actually going up. All the footage of the body bag stopped. All the coverage of Cindy Sheehan stopped because – it would not be the thing to do to to embarrass a saintly Democrat president. Anyway, I, I got to tell you, I, I have this real strong fairness thing going on in my head. I don't care. Fine, you want to, you know, you want to, you want to say this is happening. This is terrible. You want to say maybe separating kids at the border is terrible. 
then tell me it was terrible when Barack Obama was doing it, and I will believe it's actually important to you. But if there's, you know, one set of rules, but it's always different, that's D with parentheses, when our guy does it, we're not talking about principles, we're talking about whims. Long-winded, uh, long-winded buildup. So I wanted to write a nonfiction book about all the stuff that was going on in Iraq during the uh, war on terror when George W. Bush was president that you didn't hear about. Uh, and, and I actually used some of that research in, um, in Lonesome George. But, you know, there were great things going on. Marriages went up. They opened like 150 newspapers. They had cell phones again. All the stuff uh, they could do because they didn't have murderous lunatics running the country. But that wasn't being told. You know, we were being told other things. So I was, I was, you know, writing Petraeus and access to your, you know, your basically just your daily reports because that's where a lot of the information was. And they went, great, we love this idea. Say, which newspaper do you work for? And, and I got to go, I'm just this guy who wants to write this book. And they're like, sorry, man, we can't help you. So I had all this information that was kind of, you know, bubbling up there. And one day, I, I, I swear this is true, I heard this voice kind of say, and that's why I was referring to my medication, this voice said, it sure must be lonesome to be George. And that I started seeing the opening part of the book. That was, I sat down and I pretty much wrote the first chapter in a day. Um, a long day, but, uh, you know, and then it just kind of went from there. I mean, one of the, 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 so you asked, I'm sorry, let's get back to your original question. <laughs> the, <laughs> what is, this, what is Lonesome George about? Lonesome George is an alternative history, which, uh, imagines what would happen to America and the world if about 2008, August 20, I think it was August 22nd, 2008, if Al Qaeda had gotten their act together and hit us with some coordinated attacks, uh, you know, and and Matt and and from there it becomes kind of a a little bit of a domino because the uh, you know Al Qaeda hits us and that staggers our uh, our government and starts to affect our social fabric. But then we get the opportunistic folks like uh, the the Chinese go, hey, I've always wanted some real estate on the West Coast. So they start to try to get, uh, you know, kick us when we're down, basically. And it it talks about uh, America after after those kinds of attacks, um, and follows everyday people, you know, just just average Joes, you and me, who are trying to get get by in this this broken uh, this broken country. There's uh, people that are stuck in occupied areas on the east and west coast, uh, California. Uh, is uh, there's a ca- the Caliphate of California is there known by by the uh, the demi as uh, the the rulers are called the Caliban for the California Taliban. Uh, there anyway. Uh, so it is the story of America's uh, an America staggered, an America that uh, bites back. When uh, when you started writing the book uh, and and it had kind of turned into this thing that you didn't originally intend, uh, but then kind of stories started coming out of it. You, you know, you, you said your original intent was to uh, maybe tell some of the stories that didn't get told, uh, but then all of a sudden it becomes this this make believe story that's informed by what you wanted to get out. Uh, but at at what point did uh, did this this world of this book kind of become real to you and you realized that that this was maybe more interesting than the factual story that you wanted to tell um uh again i was just writing at this time i was just writing for myself i i'd given up submitting stuff to anybody so i just sat down and wrote the story and and um i had some i had some coworkers reading it who were enjoying it a lot um at the time and um, I think when people began responding to some of the characters and, you know, saying, well, that person, 
that person's a bitch or you know that kind of thing it's like oh wow they're 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 starting to get really sucked into this and um uh and then as i as i wrote further along because one of the things that annoyed me you know talking about the principal whims thing as i was kind of writing along i mean one of the th- i've been thinking about this a lot like uh, i mean clearly i i see certain things in the world uh, a certain way i I, I, I believe certain groups that say they want to kill us, uh, grind us into the dust. Um, uh, but it occurred to me, you know, how, why would someone, you know, a Rosie O'Donnell, Alec Baldwin, they, their product of, you know, like the rest of us, their upbringing, their experiences, the, the information they have and their beliefs. And uh, Alec Baldwin, originally I started using him as a joke in the uh, the first story. But as I learned more about Alec Baldwin, I realized, in spite of the fact that the guy is a, a huge jerk at times, he's also really principled. Right. For instance, you know, when the when the movie, uh, they were making that puppet movie, and I can't, Team America, right. where they, 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 they mocked him mercilessly, he heard about it, he went to the, the, the directors and said, I'll do my voice. I know you guys are going to slag on me for two and a half hours. But for whatever reason, they turned him down. But I thought that showed a certain amount of, you know, um, intestinal fortitude. And, and uh, you know, then he, then he also, you know, had his, his, own, uh, his own service. But it struck me that if Alec Baldwin had different experiences, he might begin to maybe see things the way other people do without the need to resort to, they're all terrible human beings or, or, you know, whatever it is. So, uh, I just started trying, I just kind of imagined, uh, if, if they had those experiences, if Molly Ivins, who was this, uh, Texas, uh, uh, columnist who was just brutal to George W. Bush, you know, what if she had different experiences and, uh, with the, Caliban, you know, and and how, how would that change her perceptions? Well, talking about uh, Alec Baldwin and and your, uh, uh, you know, wondering if 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 he might be, uh, you know, come down on a different side if his, uh, you know, uh, formational experiences would have been different. There there once was a time, Griff, where we could um, disagree with our neighbor. Uh, we could read something. Uh, by someone that was not in our camp or uh, that that stretched us intellectually um, and and not burn the the city down when we found something we disagreed with we that, could, that's uh, nonsense what are you crazy I, I, I know I know I know and um, it, it is so refreshing when you find people on on both sides of the arguments that are actually principled and and actually believe what they're spouting off it, instead of just you know uh, finding whatever the next protest on MSNBC is and 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 you know running out with their signs there it, you can actually have dialogue with those people most of the time um, and and we we have lost that the art of conversation and the art of of debate there, there's no such thing as debate anymore yeah yeah, uh, it's sad. <laughs> and, I, and I don't even know what to add to that, other than you know, um, uh, you know, you write things that uh, hopefully challenge people and make them uh, sit up and and think about what is and what could be and what what might have been, uh, and, uh, and 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 sadly, I, I think most people, most uh, uh, folks that find your book now, may just you know throw it across a room and, and scream instead of maybe trying to. To, to find out what the intent was. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are you, um, have you gotten much feedback on, uh, on the, uh, uh the Lonesome George series? Do you, do you find that people, uh, you know, are, are resonating with the story and, and, uh, appreciating it? And do you ever get hate mail? Um, I have not, uh, received hate mail on that. Congratulations. Yeah. I was, I was happy. Um, I think people, people do resonate. I mean, uh, you know, uh, one of the nicest, one of the coolest things about uh, the modern publishing and blogs and uh, you know whatnot is you can you really can hear from the readers pretty easily and and sometimes they just find you. 
Um, and for instance, uh, you know, when I get that, that email from somebody saying, you know, I, I picked this up and, and I couldn't put it down and, and where's the next book? Stuff like that's really gratifying. Um, and one of the more, uh, one of the more gratifying uh, reviews I ever got was from a, a friend of mine that I was actually in one of my plays back in the day. Uh, he is uh, of the more liberal persuasion, but he's a writer and we've, we've always supported each other. We're, you know, the guys could, we could still dis- disagree. And, um, you know, I read his novels, which are like gay urban fantasy and not to my taste, but I can still find, um, you know, I can enjoy the craft and, uh, I'm, I've, I've been encouraging this guy to keep going. So he's got this amazing world. Um, nice. but he read, he read Lonesome George and, um, the, the first, the first thing in his return email to me that he said was you bastard. <laughs> and, and I said, wow, that, this is high praise because he went on to say that, uh, you know, he said he was just saying that he thought I'd, I'd managed to be fair, even to the people I disagreed with. Uh, and then the story. So, I, I think that's a, a very high compliment, uh, and and it becomes more so uh, the farther down this road we get, where um, we, we've lost the art of dialogue and being able to disagree with each other and still uh, love each other, at least like each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, how many books in the series? The third one's out now. Did you say there's going to be four? Yes, sir. Um, there. Um... Um, yes, I've got, uh, the first book is called the big bang because that's, uh, that's how the characters re, uh, refer to the events that, you know, shook up their world. And, um, the second book was called, uh, bringing the fire, which continued the, um, uh, continued the main story as we follow different characters. It, it turned out to be kind of a Rashomon thing. I'm, uh, following different characters from different uh, different times within the uh, the world, you know. There's there's some people several years after the Big Bang. I'm also following some people at the beginning of the Big Bang to to kind of uh, allow the readers to see what it was like at the beginning, and then also to see what what uh, some of the consequences were for other characters. Uh, and then anyway, the third uh, the third book is called The Broken Return. Um, again, where I'm just, I'm following these characters and, and everything's going to be tied up. Well, not tied up. It's not, not like, you know, the neat, uh, um, uh, all, every, everything's uh, summed up in the last 30 seconds of the show sort of thing. But, but most of the storylines will be come to a conclusion in book four. Nice. Nice. Uh, and, and what about the other series, uh, the, by the well, hands of men? Uh, that also was going to be a single novel when I started, I, uh, I had uh, I had the original the original inciting the, the the image was something I'd heard working in community theater. I was talking to an older English lady who was telling me the story uh, that her grandfather told her. So you know we must be talking like eighty years or something of experience. Who was telling who had told her I guess when she was a little girl that the worst part about fighting in World War One was listening to the screaming of the wounded horses out in no man's land. Right. Uh, and mo- much of my writing, by the way, it, it, it either comes from a question, like why is something along the lines of why is it like that? Or, um, or the other question is what would somebody do? And that was sort of uh, the question, but that was, so that idea was floating around just, and, um, and then there's, I don't want to tell this other one, but I had another interesting idea or snippet, factoid, whatever, that was out there. And one day they lined up and I suddenly had the beginning of the story and the ending of the story. And then the, ma- you know, all the magnet, the lines of magnetic force started and, and I began writing it. I thought it was going to be one book, but um, it's turned out to be probably about maybe a thousand pages so far and i've probably got another 400 pages to go but i know where it's you know with the novel like i said i just started I just stepped out on faith and i follow the the story and people show up and there's characters that i had no idea they were there and then then it's uh, people go places and do things but i know 
I'm still heading toward the end, and I know where that end is, and I'm probably about two thirds done with the final book on that, which is uh, in the By the Hands of Men series. The first book's called The Old World. The second book uh, is called Into the Flames, and the first book kind of keeps follows both characters more or less in the same at the same time, but then the the next two books um, we follow their stories separately. Uh, the third book was called The Wrath of a Righteous Man. Um, and then book four right now, my wife hates this title, but I like it, is called Ringside at the Circus of the Fallen. Ooh, I uh, like that. Yeah, I, I do too. Um, and I think you'll like the series, man, if you haven't read it. Um, um, in fact, somebody just Facebooked me is, who's reading it now and was they were happy with their experience so far. Uh, I am uh, going to pick that series up now, and uh, I- I'm excited about it. Um, Griff, if people are just discovering you now, uh, I mean, this has been a fast hour that we've been on, uh, and I-, I feel like we could chat all night. Um, so, uh, so please do come back soon, and let's uh, let's chat some more. Uh, yes, sir. But uh, if people are just discovering you for the first time, uh, where can they find you online to kind of dig into your work and and uh, and, and you know uh, learn all about you? Well, um, they could go to my uh, my website, Roy M, as in Madison, uh, Griffiths, that's G-R-I-F-F-I-S, dot com. Um, I've got the usual about me's, and I've got some, some recent uh, uh, postings and whatnot. Um, you can find my cultural commentary on culture and media, actually. Um, going back to my love of film uh, and my disappointment um, <laughs> at Liberty Island. That's one word, Liberty Island.com. Uh, excuse me, Liberty Island mag, M a G short for magazine, Liberty Island mag.com where I've, I've done um, a bit of um, cultural commentary nice. and uh, you can find my books on Amazon. And I say again, big bang, Volume one of the Lonesome George Chronicles is ninety nine cents uh, now, and the first book of the uh, By the Hands of Men series is free on Kindle. Nice. Uh, I'm going to put links to all of that in the show notes. Uh, thank you for joining me today, Griff. Man, I appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure, and I hope we can do it again soon. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. The brutes of the Andersonville Prison Hospital have moved me to the dead room, or so it has come to be known. None so domiciled have yet left this place. We receive only the smallest rations and only cursory care to reduce our odors and spare the nostrils of our keepers. The good Christians of the Confederacy do not see any need to provide comfort to those who will soon sleep soundly enough underground. You must know, at least, how your father came to such an end. At Doctortown, Kilpatrick entrusted me with the conquest of a railroad trestle, and my bummers, my demolition team, acquitted themselves admirably thanks to my ingenuity with powder. We successfully destroyed the trestle work past Morgan's Lake. This would prove to be my entire contribution to the war. Federal troops were unable to capture the bridge or overcome the enemy's battery. Kilpatrick withdrew, and my bummers and I found ourselves on the wrong side of the Altamaha River, behind the enemy line with no hope of reaching our encampment. Rebels accosted us, taking our remaining supplies. We escaped and headed south, hoping by a long march to reach Seymour's forces in Jacksonville, but we encountered other rebel encampments at Jessup. Four of my men were lost to gunfire. We marched west, then south again, barely evading capture. We had no choice but to brave the great swamp Okefenokee. Oh, On and on it goes, in every direction, endlessly. We trudged through miles of grasping mud and noxious rot, pursued by hunger and the mosquito, scratching at our arms and faces until all our skin was scourged. 
We lived off alligator meat at first, then nothing at all. My men grew mutinous, blamed me for all their misfortunes, threatened to throw me in a sack, weigh me down with stones, and sink my body. Yet was I not equally hungry? Did I not starve? I grew weary of their endless insubordination and contempt. Finally, they took hold of me and swore they would hang me by the neck for leading them to ruin. They were five in number, younger than I and more muscular. I was no match for them physically. They lay their hands on me and I burned them. I burned those men. The flame rose from me as from a volcano, stripping the skin from those boys, blackening their faces, roasting their flesh. And let this be my final ghastly confession. I feasted that night, feasted on the meat of my prospective murderers. And that is how I survived. I staggered alone from that swamp, a mad thing, fueled by outrage and guilt. I saw an encampment of rebel soldiers and surrendered myself gladly. They say in Andersonville prison all men are brothers, equal in filth, equal in terror, equal in ruin. Yet I feel I may claim some small distinction, at least, for I am surely damned to a greater extent than any here. 